In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is Orthodox Survival Course, Class 60. The title of today's talk is Returning to Ourselves, Session 1. This is Father Stephen Allen, um, speaking from St. Irene Church in Rochester Hills, Michigan. I want to welcome everyone back to our little class. Forgive me for being away for so long. We've had the holidays, of course. And uh, as a special blessing during the holidays, I was in the hospital being treated for a heart condition, but uh, I'm alive and well. So I guess the Lord wants me to live to fight another day. And thanks to all who knew about my little problem and uh, offered their prayers. And uh, God willing, we'll be around for a while. So today's class is called Returning to Ourselves, Session 1, because we're going to have a series of sessions called Returning to Ourselves, based on the words of our Lord in his parable of the prodigal son, when the son came to himself. And when he came to himself, he arose and came to his father. Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 15. Again, I want to thank our donors. May the Lord reward you, reward your love with his grace. And to everyone, um, if you can, consider a gift to help me out. If you have PayPal, you can send a gift to my account at Father Stephen Allen, at, that is fr Stephen Allen at gmail.com. And uh, I want to thank especially those who give me a little gift or a larger gift sometimes uh, every month. It's, I'm very moved by your support. And um, I always I want to assure you that with God's help, by your prayers and by God's grace, I'll use properly the good things that you give me and for God's glory and for the work of the church. A little prefatory note, uh, a reminder that I am started to insert into all my talks, uh, is just a reminder, my lectures are the result of my own studies and they give my opinion within a spectrum of allowable opinion that does not violate the dogmas or canons or moral teaching of the church and whose publication, distribution, uh, does not hinder her saving mission. There are many listeners, apparently, who have found my talks helpful. And for this, well, glory to God. If there are those who don't like them, of course, they're under no obligation to listen to them or to agree with them. Right? Father Stephen is not the ecumenical councils. Yeah, or doesn't pretend to be. <laughs> this next section of the talk, an introductory section I want to call The Signs of the Times. The Signs of the Times. As we speak in January of the year of our Lord, 2021, there are ominous signs here in the United States and throughout the formerly Christian world that we are swiftly coming or have already come under, swiftly coming under, already come under, some kind of totalitarian rule by an explicitly anti-Christian, even anti-human oligarchy, which now openly intends, have, have announced, right, they openly intend to persecute anyone attempting to lead a moral and traditional life of any kind, including, of course, us Orthodox, who, after all, are the principal and ultimately only effective enemies of the demons who command this global elite. There is much that can be said, and that we have already said, about this from the point of view of an orthodox philosophy of history, if you will go back to all of our classes starting with the French Revolution and forward, and review all that we've said in those classes, I think you will get the picture. But now it is time to put what we have learned to the test. We need to be in immediate preparation for a very different kind of life than what we in the so-called free West have known before. And therefore my task now is not so much to keep expanding on the historical framework, although we'd like to do that as well in some future classes, but it's not so much to keep expanding on the historical framework as to address specific obstacles which prevent us from living effectively in the period we're about to enter, or have already entered. With this in mind, let us recall one of the points we made in our last class. We have to correct the things we have control over, and that starts with our own selves, our own minds and hearts.
So the theme for this part of our course is going to be returning to ourselves. I'm calling this part of our course returning to ourselves inspired by that moment in the parable of the prodigal son when the wayward son realizes that he has departed far from who he really is and become someone else, not the person his father had raised him to be. He sees what he has become and he wants to repent of it to return to his father, which is also a return to himself, to his real self. At the end of our last class, I told you that in our next few classes, we will be talking about deeply ingrained errors that the great stereopticon has implanted in our minds, errors for which we have to repent in order to recover our true selves as human beings and as Orthodox Christians. There are two points here that need more explanation. One, one must repent of false ideas even if one did not previously know one had them. And two, several of the errors we will be discussing strike at the root of our humanity as well as our Christian identity. So point one, repenting of false ideas. Recall that knowing truth is the basis for right action and that therefore believing in a falsehood is the most basic sinful state prior to the misuse of the will. I'll say that again. Knowing truth is the basis for right action. And therefore, believing in a falsehood is the most basic sinful state, and it's prior to the misuse of the will. How can you use your will properly if you don't know what direction to point it in? Our first parents fell when they first accepted the lie of the devil. And then on the basis of their mental deformation, they deformed their will to disobey God. Now we have been brainwashed since childhood by many lies of the devil through this vast mechanism that in our course we have labeled the great stereopticon, this all-encompassing mechanism, or rather an entire mental matrix within which we live, created by the spirit of Antichrist in these latter days, a mechanism, a matrix, that includes all the communications media, the scientific establishment, the educational system, the government, medicine, corporate business, finance, in short, all the institutions of public life. They have all been utterly deformed and perverted from their right use, hollowed out by anti-Christian subversives who hate God. They hate the human race. They hate you and me. The insides of all the public institutions have been hollowed out, and only the facade remains. On the inside, behind the facade, animating all official public life, there is demonism, the spirit of Antichrist, and the servants of the spirit of Antichrist control all the levers of power. Humanly speaking, of course, God's providence and sovereignty remain absolute, but here we're discussing how matters appear on the earthly level. The subversives have become the establishment, and they are using the vast power of this all-encompassing mechanism to destroy not only truth, but the very concept that there is truth, and that it is knowable in the minds of men. We need to come to ourselves to wake up and realize what has been done to our minds, because when we are in this state of delusion, it is impossible to sift through and understand everything that is happening around us. When you're in a state of delusion, it's impossible to sift through and understand everything happening around you. It doesn't matter to what extent we're not to blame. Okay? Self-justification, self-pity will get us nowhere. We must love the truth, seek it at all costs, and be willing to suffer for it. Without this, there is no human integrity, much less eternal salvation. Second point, recovering our humanity. All spiritual errors basically are a form of delusion, which we call in Greek plani, or in Slavonic prelist. All spiritual errors are basically a form of delusion, and they prevent us from recovering the likeness of God. And furthermore, some of the very basic errors we will be discussing not only prevent spiritual life, properly speaking, 
but even attack something more basic, the precondition for spiritual life, which is simply functioning as a human being, even a fallen human being. That is, they prevent us from retaining even the image of God. They make someone something other than human, not in his essence, but certainly in his energies. That is, uh, it's making you something other than human, not in, not that you're no longer human in your potential or in your essential constitution, but in all the functions of a human being, the, the, op the operations or activities of a human being all become deformed in something other than human. Remember that the project of the Antichrist elites is no longer only to prevent our attaining the likeness of God. It's no longer simply an anti-Christian project. They want us to go, they want to go even further. They want to destroy the very image of God in man by creating a new race of transhumans. Here it would be good to recall the three levels of human life that the fathers talk about, that which is above nature, that which is according to nature, and that which is below nature. Our enemies want to create, although we, of course we know they really can't really create anything, only God creates, but they want to, in, uh, in quotation marks, or in a relative sense, they want to create a kind of post-humanity that is trapped in a permanent state below nature, that's hardwired to be below nature, that can't escape. A humanity so deformed as to be unrecognizable. So you see, following the one whom our Lord himself told their predecessors is their father, that is Satan, see Gospel according to St. John, chapter 8, verse 44. Following the one whom our Lord himself told their predecessors is their father, that is Satan, these transhumanists strive to mock God, the Creator, by creating a supposed post-human race. Of course, they can't really create anything. They can only pervert, deform, and destroy. That's the demonic idea of creativity. This transhumanism is not a marginal idea that one finds only in strange websites. It is the stated and public purpose of the most influential policymakers in the emerging global governance system at this very moment. They hold highly publicized conferences. They write books. They make videos. They talk about it all the time now. Today, all of this is out in the open. And we can say with St. John the Theologian, little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby know that it is the last time. That's the first epistle of St. John, chapter 2, verse 18. Long before they went public, however, these, with transhumanism as a goal stated through the mass media, the elites prepared everyone gradually to accept it over several generations by means of all the techniques of the great stereopticon, which have implanted in our minds as normal ideas that are actually very abnormal. Not only anti-Christian, but anti-human. They boiled the frog slowly, as they say, by getting people to accept as attractive and normal and necessary for social acceptance ideas and ways of life that are actually very deformed and very sick. But they introduced them gradually and only with rarely, very rarely with explicit reference to the end game, which is transhumanism. The destruction not only of the likeness of God, but even the image of God in man. Now, if we are to resist transhumanism, we have to recognize these false ideas that prepare people to accept transhumanism. Ideas that have been hardwired also, to a greater or lesser extent, been hardwired into us. We have to recognize that they became part of what we think we need to have sanity and social acceptability. They have become inherent to our sense of self. And therefore, to admit that they're wrong, that we have to uproot them, that we have to return to traditional non-stereopticon ways of looking at life and living life, this is a painful process, as we discussed last time, but it must be done. Let us arise and return to ourselves, so that we can truly return to the loving Father, 
who awaits our repentance. How can we be orthodox if we're not even human? Unless we repent of our so-called progressive ideas and ways of life that make us function as something other than human, our orthodoxy becomes just a fragment of life, not life itself. It becomes a mind game, a, a disembodied fantasy adventure, or an aesthetic plaything, or a pseudo-spiritual hobby disconnected from reality. And it becomes something other than what it really is, what it's supposed to be, the power of God transforming our corruptibility and making our entire psychosomatic organism in all of its activities, including the personal, familial, and social, capable of holiness and eternal life. So we're going to, bring our, we're going to begin our catalog of errors. So what are some of these false ideas? Today we shall begin with two of them, and in the next few classes we'll continue the list. The two false ideas I'm going to talk about today are scientism and Freudianism and personal fulfillment. Scientism. Scientism is the crude religious idea, and it really is a kind of surrogate religion, that there is this amazing monolithic unified engine of all human progress called science, and that it's always right. It is always progressing to greater and greater truth, and that you have to believe it and you have to obey it, or you're some kind of a stupid worthless person who is against the progress and welfare of the human race. What is ironic is that scientism is an outmoded, long discredited way of thinking among honest scientists who understand the fallibility and imperfection of scientific findings and who know that so-called discoveries are often driven by purely mercenary, even malicious, agenda. Even when researchers, along with the engineers and social planners who put the findings of research into action through technology, even when these people are well-meaning, the very nature of empirical science involves many mistakes, constant revision, and a very limited range of understanding, and a very limited range of apl applicability to human life. Yet, the scientific establishment and its propagandists keep presenting each new supposed established fact, often completely contradictory to the previous supposedly established fact, as so true and so reliable and of such unlimited range of application that public policy must be based on it, no matter how subversive, no matter how destructive it is to normal common sense and truly human ways of living. Thus, the anti-Christian elite has successfully brainwashed a critical mass of the population to believe that this trustworthy, infallible institution really exists. An especially dangerous subset of scientism is the worship of the medical establishment, because those who control the doctors and who control the drug makers have so much power over people's minds and bodies. Lenin once said, medicine is the cornerstone of achieving socialism. It is critical to remember that science is the twin of magic. Science is the twin of magic. And the temptation of the magician, one, that he can become a superior being by controlling nature through cooperation with demonic forces, and two, that other people are something less than he is, something less than human. This temptation of the magician is essentially the same as the temptation of the scientists and engineers and those who control the scientists and engineers with their money and thereby control the direction of science and technology. This recognition that science can become subject to diabolical control and used in diabolic ways to oppose God, this recognition is not a wild theory newly created by marginal paranoiacs who run weird websites. It is a great theme within the cultural inheritance of our entire civilization, going all the way back to the myth of Prometheus. In modern times, it's illustrated in literature by the story of Faust. 
Also, and more to the point, our own Orthodox tradition tells us that there is not a hard and fast boundary between science and magic, between the apothecary and the peddler of lethal potions. It is vanity. It is vanity and an ignorant, irresponsible, and sinful disingenuousness blithely to trust the vast and explicitly anti-Christian apparatus that now holds the reins of earthly power through science and medicine over the bodies and minds of men. It is idolatry, and those who worship this idol will suffer the fate of all idolaters. Within Christian civilization, of course, the Church to a great extent directed the efforts of science and medicine. And there were many pious and enlightened scientists and physicians, inventors, and so forth, and even today there are still a few. When the Church is the dominant influence over science, technology, and medicine, this is the best possible situation, not only for the Church, but for science itself, because it is precisely the enlightenment of mind that the gospel brings, that grace brings, that the recognition of man as a reason-endowed being made in the image of God brings, which makes real knowledge, which in Latin is scientia, in Greek episteme, where we get the word science, real knowledge and our science, right? which makes real science possible. But over the last few centuries, since the Renaissance, and especially in the open revolutionary period of the last 200 years, the oligarchy that controls Francis Bacon's Atlantis project of an all-powerful technocracy, see our Orthodox Survival Course, Class 17, and recently Class 58, this oligarchy that controls this project of the all-powerful technocracy has gradually, and by now totally, usurped the Church's rightful place as the sponsor and guide of science and medicine. Instead of claiming to seek the limited and modest good of making man's life on earth more bearable as he prepares for eternal life, the technocracy assumes that this life is all there is, and it seeks unlimited power to create a false heaven on earth. And we know where this leads. Instead, it creates hell on earth. I'm going to say a lot of this again because it's so important. Over the last few centuries, since the Renaissance, and especially in the open revolutionary period of the last 200 years, the oligarchy that controls Francis Bacon's Atlantis project of an all-powerful technocracy, see Orthodox Survival Course, Class 17 and Class 58, this oligarchy has gradually, and by now totally, usurped the Church's rightful place as the sponsor and guide of science and medicine. Instead of claiming to seek the limited and modest good of making a man's life on earth more bearable as he prepares for eternal life, the technocracy assumes that this life is all there is, and it seeks unlimited power to create a false heaven on earth. And we all know where that leads. Instead of heaven on earth, it creates hell on earth. Naturally, as the scientific establishment and the medical establishment are more and more dominated by anti-Christian and anti-human people, their methods and goals do and will become more and more anti-Christian and anti-human. They progress into more and more ignorance, not more and more knowledge, and they become less and less trustworthy, not only because they lust ever for more and more power over others, but also because they have become completely out of touch with reality. Just go to the websites of the United Nations, or UNESCO, the World Health Organization, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, George Soros' Open Society Foundation, and so forth. Okay? Read Klaus Schwab's plan for the Great Reset. Go back to the classic futurist screeds from the 20th century of H.G. Wells and Bertrand Russell, proposing world government through technological control of the masses. Read it for yourself. See for yourself. These people are totally out of touch with reality. But these deluded, these deluded, insanely arrogant people and their fellow travelers are precisely the people driving public policy everywhere and forming the minds of the masses of humanity 
outside the church, as well as, sorry to say, some individuals who are nominally within the church. So it's extremely important, really a matter of life and death, to understand this and to become an intelligent critic. Not a knee-jerk reactionary, but a calm and intelligent critic of the ubiquitous, impersonal, and mercenary scientific and medical official establishments. Viewing everything they say and everything they do very cautiously and through an orthodox lens. What you will find is that those who practice real science, those who are striving to practice real medicine, are now often marginalized and their careers and even their lives are destroyed and their voices are thereby silenced precisely because they are seeking the goals of true science and true medicine that is scientific truth and man's well-being and not the goal of the scientific and medical establishment which is to advance the agenda of the antichrist elite who control the money that funds the official and acceptable scientists the drug makers and the cooperative doctors. As a side note, I'd like to say that we should really reach out to these sincere people. For all science, all philosophy that really is true, as St. Basil teaches, belongs to the Church. Nothing that is true is alien to the Church. In a way, these marginalized truth seekers and truth tellers who are suffering so much right now are like secular martyrs and confessors of our time if only they knew it, they would realize that they really belong to the church. That we And we, for our part, should honor them and listen to them on the matters within their realm of competence. Yes, they may be agnostic libertarians or Roman Catholics or Protestants or even neo-pagans, but if only they would convert to orthodoxy, they would find the fulfillment of their search for truth, the truth for which they're suffering. For all truth comes from the Logos of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. So, to get back to our goal, which is repentance and coming to ourselves, we need to ask the Lord to enlighten us to see and acknowledge to what extent we have believed in this scientistic myth of unlimited progress and the idea that science and medicine are always benign and moral, an idea that is not a harmless, morally neutral delusion, but rather a preposterous and destructive kind of idolatry. We need to discover within ourselves to what extent we mentally practice this idolatry, driven by cowardice, or lack of faith, and an infantile desire for pleasure, comfort, freedom from suffering, and even deliverance from death itself. We need to see that the claims of the scientific establishment are simply a restatement of the primordial lie of Satan to our first parents, that he and not God are the source of life and immortality, that he and not God is the source of life and immortality. We need to see that man is not progressing into a higher and better way of life through science, but rather man is descending to an ever lower and worse moral and spiritual state, a completely carnal, subhuman state, by exchanging faith in our Creator for faith in the sons of men in whom there is no salvation. Let us beg the Lord to give us the eyes to see all this and to repent, while being grateful for whatever real good that real science and medicine can offer and do offer us, while supporting our good orthodox or simply moral physicians and scientists and so forth, we must reject the myth of progress and see this new Atlantis project for what it is. It's a new Tower of Babel, the radical revolt against God by demon-dominated men who are constructing a world government based on technological dominance, not simply over society in general, but over our very minds and bodies. We must recognize that this is a totally illegitimate form of governance. It is explicitly condemned by God in Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel. It partakes inherently and completely of the spirit of Antichrist. Therefore, it is neither established nor approved by God. It's only allowed by God because of our sins, for which we must repent. And to live our repentance, and not just talk about it, we must be willing to suffer. We have to endure the consequences 
of going outside the camp to be with Christ, as St. Paul writes in Hebrews 11. Thus, scientism. Now let's talk about another error in our catalog of errors, Freudianism and personal fulfillment. In one of our earlier talks, we referred to a video series called The Century of the Self. You can look it up on the internet, The Century of the Self, which tells the story of how those in power in the 20th century used the insights of contemporary psychology to create the media propaganda machine that they have deployed with such frightening effect to practice mass mind control and thereby create the current global culture of mindless materialism and selfishness based on the idea of personal fulfillment. It is not a mere coincidence that the founder of this technology, a man named Edward Bernays, was the nephew of Sigmund Freud. Bernays's technological project, his propaganda mech, uh, machine, direct, directly fulfilled Freud's cherished dream, as explained in Freud's manifesto, Civilization and Its Discontents, the dream of destroying Christian civilization through destroying all moral constraints, destroying all ascetical discipline, and especially destroying the traditional mores relating to family life and sexual behavior. I'm going to say this again. It is not a mere coincidence that the founder of this <clears throat> brainwashing technology that we call advertising and public relations and the mass media, the founder of this technology, a man named Edward Bernays, was the nephew of Sigmund Freud. Bernays' technological project directly fulfilled Freud's cherished dream, as explained in Freud's Lat Manifesto, Civilization and Its Discontents. The dream of destroying Christian civilization through destroying all moral constraint, all ascetical discipline, and especially the traditional mores relating to family life and sexual behavior. So the great stereopticon and the sexual revolution have the same people as their creators and ideologues. The great stereopticon, the big brainwashing matrix, and the sexual revolution have the same people, often physically related to each other, as their creators and ideologues. That's why you notice that everything in the media and education nowadays always somehow gets back to some kind of perversion of sex. Freud presents this destruction of Christianity through sexual revolution as a great leap forward for the human race, because then the individual will be free to pursue his fulfillment in freedom from biblical morality, a fulfillment which is really, of course, just slavery to the passions. And Freud's project of destruction has, in fact, been widely successful, except that the actual outcome, of course, is that people have become less and less truly fulfilled, less themselves, and more and more mindless boring automata enslaved to their passions, indistinguishable from one another, subsumed into the mass of atomized post-humanity, the gathering herd chasing ever more frantically after happiness and never finding it, leaping off the cliff and drowning themselves in the life of sin. Freud's theories, of course, do not remotely resemble actual scientific findings. They are rather a mishmash of quasi-religious gibberish, a grotesque fantasy, which nonetheless exerts a hypnotic, demonic power over the Freudian believer, very much like the demonic power that Marxist gibberish exerts over the true believers in Karl Marx. And it does not only affect conscious students and believers in Freudianism, though very few practitioners today use Freud's psychoanalytic method, the Freudian ideology has malformed our culture. It has permeated the air we breathe to such an extent that everyone suffers from acting on Freudian assumptions. Now, there are other schools of psychology, of course. 
and the ones that are least pretentious, the ones that are closest to simple common sense, and are the least intrusive, that have the most modest claims, can offer legitimate practical advice, legitimate practical advice, for controlling outwardly destructive behavior, so-called coping mechanisms, right? And they do help people, but only when the psychological or a psychiatric practitioner is a serious Christian, or at least a moral person, and not a deviant of some kind, which is sadly often not the case. At any rate, an Orthodox Christian has to approach secular psychology very cautiously in order not to fall into a humanistic and ecumenistic approach to life where one is looking for truth in all the wrong places outside the church. The church where alone the whole undistorted truth can be found. In addition to our faithful looking for answers outside the church, an even more dangerous problem for us presents itself today. Regardless of the school of psychology under question, the secular psychologistic mindset, the phronema, right, the psychologistic phronema, characterized by the focus on the self, constant analysis of the self, the endless, fut the in the endless futile quest for happiness centered on the self. This phronema has crept into orthodox circles and it's distorted the traditional understanding of orthodox life as well. Putting aside the church's traditional, scriptural, patristic practice of calling the sinner to repentance, calling the sinner to heroic self-sacrifice, forgetfulness of self, rejecting all these things, a newly appeared pseudo-patristic, hyper-therapeutic model of orthodoxy absolutizes and exaggerates the character of the church as a spiritual hospital. The ill-informed priest who believes in this one-sided approach to orthodox life can end up pandering to contemporary man's obsession with himself as a needy, pitiful victim of someone or something, can end up willy-nilly promoting the church as the best shop to go to in order to buy happiness at low prices by crafting a separate antinomian and quietistic peace where one can check out of the struggle for moral and civic responsibility and simultaneously be spiritual. The church, of course, is a spiritual hospital. We all do suffer from the illness of the passions, and we all remain in the church's therapeutic care, or, or if we want to be saved, <laughs> we choose to remain in the church's therapeutic care to the end of our lives. Without some measure of freedom from the passions, obviously we can't move on to practice the virtues without delusion, to practice the virtues unto our salvation. But moving on should be the goal. Yes, the church is indeed a loving mother. The church is indeed a house of healing where we go for nurture, understanding, condescension, and tenderness. But she is also the church militant, a fighting church of kings, warriors, prophets, martyrs, and ascetics, heroes all, people who are not preoccupied with themselves, people who count their lives as naught, people whose constant concerns are God and other people and things outside of themselves generally. She is the prophetic and teaching church, openly, publicly denouncing evil, calling sin a sin, and especially not mincing words when she denounces the evil deeds of those who hold the reins of earthly power. She speaks the plain truth in season and out of season, and she does not indulge in man-pleasing. She has no respect of persons, remembering that God will crush the bones of man-pleasers, as the psalmist writes. Neglect of the church's militant character because of an exclusive and one-sided hyper-therapeuticism and pseudo-compassionate passivity goes hand-in-hand hand with the catastrophic civilizational process we see going on all around us, which is the creation of a totalitarian therapeutic nanny state based on the feminization of men and the denial or subversion 
of male authority. This, of course, involves the error of feminism, which is a profound error, or rather a witch's brew of various errors, attacking not only spiritual life, but even normal human life, that dominates our society today, which is another hardwired, sinful way of thinking we all have to repent of. Now, we'll address this problem of feminism, per se, in a later talk. So how do we repent of this cult of pleasure and self-absorption masquerading as the way to psychic health and even spiritual growth? To begin with, we must resolutely reject Freud's call to throw off moral restraint. We must even more radically take on ourselves the yoke of God's commandments. The Lord himself said that he had not come to abrogate the law, but to fulfill it. The plain moral commandments of the Old and New Testaments, as well as the Church's canons and penitentiary forms, remain in place now and to the end of the world. Let us ask ourselves, do we really want to forget ourselves? Do we really want to count our own lives as not? To live lives of courage and self-sacrifice? Or do we use orthodoxy as another method of self-absorption and self-pleasing? Do we presume on God's mercy, which is the sin of audacity? Do we fear his just judgment? To what extent have we unconsciously accepted the lie of Freudianism, the lie of the sexual revolution, the idea that the Church's restraints on sexual behavior and on pleasure in general are unhealthy and outdated? To what extent do we assume that life is about seeking personal fulfillment of some kind? To what extent do we use orthodoxy to seek a pleasant, falsely spiritual peace based on the abdication of our familial and social responsibilities on the pretext of wanting a tranquil, pleasant, and falsely spiritual existence? Let us ask questions like this and ask the Lord to enlighten us that we may see the truth and return to ourselves. Let us seek this day, this hour, this moment, to love God and to keep his commandments. The night before he died, our Lord said to his apostles, If you love me, keep my commandments. A listener really, uh, excuse me, a listener recently, <laughs> well, he really did, but he also, a listener recently wrote and said he liked are uh, some of my singing in an earlier talk. So you can stop listening now if you don't want to endure my singing, but some people like it. And uh, I love sharing things from uh, my own ethnic tradition, which is on my father's side, English, and uh, British in general. And there's a tune I learned years ago. It's a tune we all, almost all of us know, and it, but I learned it with the words to an evening hymn. And so I'll sing it, and you can guess the tune. When evening comes, we turn to Thee, the Maker of all things. We seek that peace and comfort which Thy kindness always brings. Protect us from all danger now and all throughout the night, that we may rise once more with Christ who is our truth and light. Give glory to the Father, who is source of all that is. Give glory to the Son who died, that we might all be his. Give glory to the Paraclete, whom they to earth do send. Give glory to our triune God, whose rule will never end. Amen. <clears throat> Probably most listening who know the tune will identify it as Star of the County Down, which is an Irish folk song set to that tune. Others may recognize that it's a hymn tune called Kingfold, identified by Vaughan Williams during his researches into folk singing in the English villages. And he named it Kingfold because that was the name of the village where he heard someone sing it. 
And it also goes with a hymn called Dives and Lazarus, a retelling of the story of Lazarus and the rich man. And there's a beautiful um, set of variations by Vaughn Williams on Dives and Lazarus, which you can I encourage everyone to look up and listen to. <clears throat> so there's an English way of singing it, and there's an Irish way of singing it. Now, I'll try it in a different register now. Uh, I think that was a little too high for me. <clears throat> Lower it a little bit. I'm going to take a sip of cognac. Right now. That's good. Very, uh, not English drink, but I, it helps the voice. Let's try singing it again. <clears throat> when evening comes, we turn to thee, the maker of all things. We seek that peace and comfort which thy kindness always brings. Protect us from all danger now and all throughout the night, that we may rise once more with Christ, who is our truth and light. Give glory to the Father, who is source of all that is. Give glory to the Son who died, that we might all be his. Give glory to the Paraclete, whom they to earth do send. Give glory to our triune God, whose rule will never end. Amen. Now that is a very civilized English way of singing it. Now we'll try a little more North Country, Celtic, Irish way of singing it. You can decide which one you like more. <clears throat> when evening comes, we turn to thee, the maker of all things. <clears throat> we seek that peace and comfort which thy kindness always brings. Protect us from all danger now and all throughout the night that we may rise once more with Christ, who is our truth and light. Give glory to the Father, who is source of all that is. Give glory to the Son, who died, that we might all be his. Give glory to the Paraclete, whom they to earth do send. Give glory to our triune God, whose rule will never end. Amen. The Lord bless all of you. Thank you for your prayers. And um, let's abjure the system, fight the technocracy, be good Christians, and save our souls. Amen. <clears throat>